welcome to our study on the book of Hebrews. I'm so excited to have you joining along with me this summer in studying this impactful book of the New Testament that has so many implications for the workings of our faith, through where our faith comes from, through understanding the original context of, of the teachings of Christianity. It's a very important book. It's a very difficult book at times to understand because it requires a little bit of background, but I'm so excited to have you join along with us this summer. My name is Garrett, and on behalf of everyone at NCC, thank you and welcome to this summer study. We are going to be going through the book over the course of the next 10 weeks. By now, hopefully you've taken a look at the reading plan, and you might have realized that not every week we will be doing the same amount of reading. That is because we're going to be reading through this book according to the structure of the book. So there might be some weeks where we only read a few verses and some weeks where we read two to three chapters in that week. And the point of that is we're following the structure, the outline of the book, so that our reading better fits the teaching and context of this book. Now, if you've ever read the book of Hebrews before, there might have been times where you got a little bit confused. Similar to the book of Romans or the book of Revelation in our New Testament, Hebrews requires some understanding, some background, in order to grasp the meaning that's within the text. So, for example, one thing I like to say in reading through the book of Revelation is that really to understand the book, you have to have the Old Testament in your left hand while you have the New Testament in your right hand. You have to understand the prophets. You have to understand some of the imagery in order to fully grasp the teaching with Revelation. Hebrews isn't, very, isn't much different. To really understand the book of Hebrews, you need to understand some of the history of Israel, but you also need to understand some of the practices, the, the law of Moses, the priesthood, the atonement, these are all concepts that we have brought into our Christian vernacular, but to really understand where they apply, we have to go back to the Old Testament. We have to go back to the teachings that Israel would have understood. And that's why this book is labeled to the Hebrews, because it is written in a sense that it's meant for he Hebrew Christians to understand how their faith as an Israelite has been fulfilled in Christ. But at the same time, this book is different than many of the other books in the New Testament. If you look at the Gospels, we have pretty straightforward evidence that Matthew is written by Matthew, Mark was written by Mark, Luke by Luke, John by John. If we look at all of the epistles, all of the letters, the author is stated and the audience of that letter is stated pretty straightforwardly. Hebrews is different. We are never given any indication of who the author is. Throughout church history, the book of Hebrews has been attributed to Paul, probably most commonly, but in recent scholarship, there's a lot of evidence to show that Paul might not have written this letter. And so some people believe that Apollos wrote it. Some people have argued for Luke. Some people have argued for John. Some people have even argued for Priscilla writing the book of Hebrews. The fact of the matter is we don't know who wrote this book, but we have a lot of evidence to show that it was written to a Hebrew audience. And then more than that, it was written as originally as a sermon to a Hebrew audience and as a originally as a sermon. So here's what that means. So if the book was written primarily as a sermon, that means that it was first given as a teaching to a congregation. It was given in a way that it was oral, not written word. And so when we think of sermons, we think of someone standing on a stage, looking at the congregation, and giving essentially a 30-minute lecture that has points and application. It's hopefully expository, which means we're taking a specific text and going verse by verse or, or meaning by meaning of the text and explaining what this text means in a logical manner. Teachings and sermons in the first century were much different. Instead, for example, 
a teacher, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, would stand before the congregation in a synagogue and would read a text and then sit down and either would give a teaching on that text and allow students to then respond to that teaching or would ask a question. And we see many questions that Jesus asked throughout the Gospels. That's a, a, a popular rabbinic practice where a question will be asked, an answer would be given, the teacher would respond to that answer, and it would keep on going and going and going. So most likely when the book of Hebrews was first given orally as a sermon or as a teaching, that's how it would have been done. And so it's very likely that the the preacher of this book would have started at a place in the Old Testament and applied it to Jesus. And then questions and responses would have continued on and on. Now, eventually, this teaching became a letter. And we get that by looking at the end of the book. So if, if you're following the reading plan, then you would have read the opening and closing, which will explain the importance of reading the beginning and the end of this book here in a second. But the end of this book, we have this emphasis that it's a letter. Because similar to all the other letters of the first century, we have this closing. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to receive this message of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Be aware that our brother Timothy has been released. If he comes soon enough, he will be with me when I see you. Greet all your le leaders and all the saints. Those who are from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you all. That's a very typical style ending of an epistle. So we get the sense that this has become a circulated letter, that there is information that is being given to those to whom the letter is going to, and there is a farewell address as well within the letter. So why then, if this was originally a sermon, is it circulated as a letter? Well, the answer is because it's important. And it gives a teaching, it gives a deeper understanding of the Christian faith. But in order to maintain the sermon-like teaching of the first century within the letter, rather than it being written as a dialogue or being written as a narrative, the teacher is conversing with the Old Testament. And so all throughout this book, you'll find that there's a teaching on who Jesus is, but that teaching starts with something from the Old Testament. And so you can almost imagine someone asking a question from an Old Testament text perspective and the teacher applying that text or answering that text, showing how that text connects with Jesus and is fulfilled in Jesus. This sermon is a conversation. It's a conversation between the teacher and the Old Testament, the teacher and his students who would have understood the Old Testament at a high level, which is why it's so important that we hold the Old Testament in one hand and hold the book of Hebrews in the other hand. But more than that, it's important that we understand Hebrew literature because this book is also structured in what's called a chiasm. Now, a chiasm is a, it's a type of literary form within Hebrew writings. You often see them in poetry, but you also often see them throughout an entire book, a chiasm, rather than how in the first century we'll write our thesis, we'll say, here's our thesis statement, and that thesis will lead into point one, point two, point three, and then the conclusion. That's how we write today. Thesis, point one, point two, point three. Hebrew writing instead uses what's called inclusio, and that is where you have A, point A, then you have point B, then you have point C, then you have point B prime, point A prime. Point A and point A prime are an inclusio. Point B and point B prime are an inclusio, which then emphasize to us that point C is the thesis. That is the main thrust of the text. That's a point that the teacher, that the writer is trying to get to, that everything leads to. All of these thoughts are getting to this point, but then receding backwards in the same way. So what that means is that when we read the opening and closing of the book of Hebrews, we're reading essentially the starting point, but we're not reading the thesis of it. 
And so when we look at the starting point here, we see that long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. And in this last day, he has spoken to us by his son. He's setting the scene. This isn't his thesis. His thesis isn't the point that he's spoken to us by his son. It is a point. It's an important aspect. But it's leading us eventually, as he keeps building on this, to the thesis of C. And then the thesis of C will recede back, and we'll see how, at the end of the book, point A and point A subprime relate and correlate to a certain degree. Now, you might be asking, so then what is point C? What is the chiasm? What's it all leading to? Well, the structure of the book that is the chiasm, we see that A, chapters 1 through 413, and A subprime, chapters 11 through 13, hold a similar emphasis. Now, that doesn't mean that the words all match up or that, you know, it has um, a similar rhyming scheme. That Hebrew poetry and Hebrew writing didn't really care about rhyming and things like that. It just means that it has similar meaning, similar emphasis behind it, as does chapters 4, 14 through 620 with chapters 10, 19 through 10, 39, which means then that C and C subprime that is kind of the main thrust here. Chapter 7, 1 through 28, and chapter 8 through 10, 18. Now, what are you, you might be wondering, what's that about? Well, it is the order of Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek, and the high priesthood. So, the emphasis here is that Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek and the high priesthood. That's the emphasis that the author is trying to make. And all of these other teachings that come along with it, from the Old Testament essentially, also connect with this main point. They lead to this point, they recede from this point, but the big point that the author is trying to get out there is Jesus comes from the order, from the shadow, so to speak, of what Melchizedek was established, and he fulfills the high priesthood, what the high priesthood of, of Israel was meant to be. He fulfills it. Now, if you're a little bit confused, that's probably because you're not a, an Israelite, <laughs> that this type of teaching is unfamiliar with you, that this type of understanding of the law of Moses, this understanding of um, ceremonial cleansing and, and things of that nature, you didn't grow up living this out and practicing this and understanding this from when you were a small child. But those that were receiving this letter did. And so they would have understood that this was the big point that the teacher is trying to get across. So throughout this summer study, as we're spending the next nine weeks going through this, um, nine weeks after today's uh, study, I hope that you'll have a greater grasp of this book, that you'll see how it connects to the Old Testament. You'll see how this teaching really unpacks Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament law. It's a very powerful book. It's a very meaningful book. And it's a book that requires us to dig a little deeper to truly, fully appreciate it. And once you do, it really helps solidify a lot of your understanding of why did Christ die? What did he accomplish? What's the point of his death? What's the point of his resurrection? Couldn't he have done it in a different manner? You know, the book of Hebrews attacks a lot of those questions and provides us answers. But we have to dig down deep to get those. So I hope that this, this uh, teaching today has helped you get the scene set for where we're going. And as you continue reading through the text of Hebrews, ask yourself, how does the structure, that it's a sermon, that there's chiasm, how does it help you interpret the book? More than that, how does the emphasis that this book is leading to Melchizedek, that it's leading to this teaching that Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, that Jesus fulfills the priesthood, as you're reading this book, think about that in the back of your mind. That is what it's leading to. So think about how everything is going to connect to that main point, and that will help you appreciate all the more 
the study as we go through. So I'm really excited to have you join us this summer. If you haven't already, make sure to read through Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 25. And then for next week, we will be digging down deeper into Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, through Hebrews 2, 18. And so if you want to read that ahead of time and then have this teaching or wait for the teaching to come out and then read the book later, the, the, that section later on, that's fine too. But I'm so excited to dig down deeper into the book of Hebrews with you this summer. And uh, we'll see you next week.